Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 13, 14. We're talking about the communion of the Holy Spirit. Talked about it last week, introduced this subject. Um, and I want to read this, uh, this introductory verse uh, again. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Paul is wrapping up his letter to the Corinthians. And uh, he says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. When he th thinks about Jesus, he thinks about grace. When he thinks about God the Father, he thinks about love. And when he thinks about the Holy Spirit, he thinks about communion. And the word communion there, uh, again, mean, uh, it's koinonia. In the Greek, it means partnership, participation, sharing, social interaction, fellowship. It's a coming together. It's a, it's a blending of our lives. Uh, and, he's, and it's as if he's saying, he, he's praying in, in the end of this letter uh, for Jesus' grace to continue to flow in their lives, for the love of God to be known in their lives, and for the communion, the sharing, the participation of the Holy Spirit to continue consistently in their lives. We, how many of you realize we need Jesus' grace and we desperately need God the Father's love but it's equally true that we desperately need communion in the Holy Spirit, the participation of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Folks, you wouldn't even be saved if it weren't for the Holy Spirit. He's the one that revealed Christ to you. He's the one that convicted you of your sins and convinced you that you needed a Savior. He's the one that effected the miraculous new birth in your spirit the moment you were born again. It's the Holy Spirit actually that went into action and saved you, converted you, birthed you, the Holy Spirit. We say, I accepted Jesus in my heart, but it was act Jesus is at the right hand of God. It was actually his spirit that came into your heart because when you have his spirit in your heart, you have him in your heart because Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one just like God the Father and Jesus are one. They're in union and in unity. Everybody see what I'm saying? So the Holy Spirit, he's, he's the God who's in the world today. <laughs> anything of God, anything you feel from God, receive from God, hear from God, get from God, anything you experience in God, it was the Holy Spirit that delivered it to you. So don't, don't you know, some people, we talk, talk about the Holy Spirit, they think like we're taking something away from Jesus. Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit. Some, I've heard people say, with their lack of biblical knowledge. Well, I just don't think we ought to talk about the Holy Spirit. I think we ought to just talk about Jesus. Well, that, that, I'd be ashamed to be that ignorant of the Scripture. Folk, the Holy Spirit is God just like the Father is God and just like Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is precious. The Holy Spirit is powerful. The Holy Spirit is needful. He's necessary. And Jesus promised, remember, he said, I'm going to send you another helper. We talked about this last month as we talked about getting help from heaven. Another helper. And in the Greek it means another helper just like the first one. The Holy Spirit's just like Jesus. He was your first helper. And, and he comes to help us. Now, if he has come to help us, sent by Jesus, granted by the Father, then shouldn't we come close to him and have fellowship with him and social interaction with him and allow him to participate in our lives. Oh, we should. And you'll never be a victorious Christian without the Holy Spirit's participation in your life. It requires his strength, his power, his ministry. Thank God for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, you, you know that we're in the dispensation of grace or the age of the church. Well, this age in which we live is also called the dispensation or the age of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was sent to the church on the day of Pentecost and he came not only to empower the church, but he came to take over. Jesus leads the church by the Holy Spirit. That's what being led by the Spirit is all about. We as Christians are to be led by the Spirit. I as a pastor am supposed to be led by the Spirit. Our church leadership, we, we endeavor to be led by the Spirit. and lead. We don't think we're smart enough to lead this church. We need the Holy Spirit to lead this church with us and through us and participating in us. Amen, somebody? So I'm just trying to get across to you and remind you of the great importance of the Holy Spirit of God. And so he's praying for this, for the, for this partnership and this participation of the Holy Spirit in their lives. 
Now, another meaning, uh, another definition of the word koinonia, another meaning of this word communion is to communicate. To communicate. And uh, it's interesting that we've been given the privilege of prayer. We can communicate with God. We can talk to God. That, that in itself is amazing, that we could talk to God from down here and he would hear us. Yeah, that, that's amazing. That God would actually listen to each and every one of us. Isn't that neat? God is not so busy he will not listen to you. He's not so far away he cannot hear you. God will hearken to your cry. And boy, we depend on it, don't we? We pray prayers every day, virtually every day. God do this. God ask me, help me with this. God bless me here. God guide me here. And yet God does that by his Holy Spirit. And when we communicate, do you realize that the reason we've got a link to God, the reason we have a channel to God, the reason we have a connection with God is because of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that transmits our prayers to God. And it's the Holy Spirit that transmits his word to us. The Holy Spirit delivers God's voice to us, his word to us, his guidance, his teaching, his mentorship, his wisdom. It's all dispensed to you by the Holy Spirit. So this word communicates important here because by the Spirit we communicate to God and God communicates to us. Now, so we, we mentioned last week that one great way to achieve communion in the Spirit with God is with your supernatural, Holy Spirit-inspired prayer language. I'm talking about speaking in tongues. We, we, we are a Spirit-filled church. We believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And we've taught on this in the last few weeks, several sessions. Uh, but I'm but now what we've gotten to is this. I'm teaching you the benefit of spiritual language. What it because that's the question always comes up. Well, you know, people first they're shocked that Christians actually speak in tongues these days. Sometimes you know they're shocked, and then and then they say, okay, okay, I got it now. Victory Church is one of those tongue talking churches. Yes, we are. We don't make a sideshow out of it. We don't brag on it. We're not always like, that's not the deal that we're all about. How many of you know we're about Jesus here? But it is in the Bible, and we're not going to ignore it. God has not given us the right to cut out the parts that we think are awkward. <laughs> Thank you. You know, it's, it's part of the Bible, and we believe the Bible, and so we got to believe every bit of the Bible, and that would include this part too. Now, so many Christians are just a little bit ashamed, just a little bit embarrassed that that's included and they really don't want to be identified with anybody that would speak with tongues. You know, I mean, I've been around a while and I've seen this over and over and over. But I like to remind people that the whole New Testament was written by Christians who spoke in tongues. I've said that two or three times lately, but it's so much fun I keep saying it. I've heard people say, I grew up around people that said, that, that tongue stuff is of the devil. Well, if, if tongues is of the devil, then the New Testament's of the devil because every New Testament book was written by a tongue-talking Christian. And if tongue-talking is crazy, then the New Testament was written by crazy men. Enough said? Come on, we, 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 you know, we may, we may have to work through what we think about this subject, but there's no... No debating the fact that the New Testament includes this subject. And it has and it needs to be defined and delineated and, and, and understood properly. Now, so what we're teaching right now is that it's a part of your communion with the Holy Spirit. We can achieve communion in the Holy Spirit by using this supernatural prayer language. You say, well, okay, okay, so, but what, what will it do? Here's the question that comes up. So what does it do for us? So what good is it? What good is it? You know, if I say, you need to change the oil in your car, and you say, well, what good is that? How many of you men know what good that is? Huh? If we don't change the oil in the car, what's going to happen to the car eventually? It, it will stop. It, it will not do what you need it to do. Uh, so... 
Folks, everything in this Bible is here for a reason. Now, it's interesting if you read just casually through the book of Acts, the history of the earliest Christians, speaking in tongues was common, normal, widespread, consistent, ongoing. And, and you, can, you can search, search, search throughout the book of Acts, the, book, uh, the books of Corinthians, all through the New Testament. You cannot find anybody making a case for stopping it. I know there's that one verse where Paul said, tongues shall cease. He also, in the same verse, said that knowledge shall pass away. Knowledge has not passed away, so neither has speaking in tongues. If knowledge has passed away, then we're all too ignorant to get anything anyway. We might as well shut our Bibles and go home. Okay? He's talking about in the future, in heaven, when perfection comes, then we will not need some of these things that we're using today in this daily life on this planet. That's what he's on about. This knowledge will be surpassed by greater heavenly knowledge. These languages that we speak in here will be surpassed by heavenly languages and heavenly knowledge and heavenly wisdom and heavenly things and eternal things. But that hasn't happened yet. There is no proof whatsoever in the Bible that speaking in tongues was to ever cease in this present age. And in fact, history records people, Christians, being filled with the Spirit and speaking in supernatural prayer language all at different times all through the church age, even up to our, to our day. Now, I, I, I grew up in a church where they didn't believe in this and didn't teach it. And God bless them. They taught all that they knew and all that they believed, and they won me to God and taught me to believe the Bible, and I appreciate them so much. But I got to reading the Bible that they told me to believe, and it included this tongues thing, and so I began to search after it, thought, search the scriptures about the Holy Spirit and I, I, speaking in tongues I call it supernatural prayer language because that's what it is and because language is a lot more genteel word than tongues, tongues upsets people languages we're used to that word and, and that's all it means, it's just an old English word that means languages and so I began to search after this and, and, and I began to see reading the Bible thoroughly over and over again through these passages that speaking in tongues was not something that was to pass away after about a hundred years but it was the overflow of the Spirit of God in somebody's life. It's, I don't like to use extra biblical illustrations, but it's kind of like a glass. If you fill a glass with water until it overflows, the only place it can overflow is out its mouth. And that's sort of the way it is when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. When you're filled to the overflowing point, the baptismal point with the Holy Spirit, God brings about a manifestation out of your mouth, an, a, a, an overflowing manifestation called speaking in tongues or spiritual language. You say, well, that's okay, okay, I can accept that, but what good is it? Glad you asked that question. That's what we're actually talking about. Okay, so uh, last week we, 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 gave, we, we gave you three things that it was good for, three things that spiritual language can accomplish in you and for you. I won't go back over them for the sake of time, but here's the three. Spiritual edification. Speaking in tongues will edify you spiritually. Edify means to build you up. In other words, it sounds like it's going to help you. It's going to build you up and make you stronger spiritually. Okay? Every Christian I ever met needed to be edified, needed to be made strong. Number two, uh, the Bible teaches that speaking in tongues is a form of supernatural prayer. By supernatural, I mean it's, it's inspired by the supernatural Holy Spirit, not just out of your own mind. It's a way to supernaturally pray and supernaturally worship God. God, the Holy Spirit, can add His power to our prayers and our worship, make, enhancing them and causing them to operate at a higher level. I won't go back in the details, but that's very important. Then number three, speaking in tongues is a, is a way of performing or achieving supernatural intercession. What's the difference in prayer and intercession? Well, intercession is a specific form of prayer. In, to intercede means to pray for someone else. And, and so what I'm saying is not only can I be edified when I pray in tongues, not only am I supernaturally praying when I pray in tongues, but thirdly, it's a, it's a, it's a form of supernatural intercession. In other words, when I pray in tongues, it's just not me praying for me. Now someone else is praying for me. Namely, the Holy Spirit. 
And how many of you know the Holy Spirit knows what you need more than you even know what you need? And I gave you, I'm not going to go over it again because I've got to move on, but I gave you this reference, Romans 8, verses 26 through 28, and I won't go back into that, but there's a reference for it. The Holy Spirit helps us, he says in verse uh, 26, uh, he helps us in our weaknesses because we don't know what we should pray for as we ought, but then the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. He can pray for us. So now I want to I share with you how important that is. I didn't get to my story. I want to tell you this story, but, uh, uh, this testimony of what God did for me one time through speaking in tongues. And I've told this before, and some of you have heard it, so just you please bear with me because we've got new people that haven't heard it. But it, it's a perfect example of how speaking in tongues can actually have a real-life benefit. It actually could save your life and the lives of your family. Um. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, received my prayer language in 1974. That's a long time ago. Since then, I've prayed in tongues every day of my life. And like I, I like to say, it's never hurt me, never ran me crazy. It has never sent me to the rubber room yet. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. It, it is only enhanced. It's maximized my experience with God. I'm convinced of that. And so I, I pray in tongues every day. I pray in English. I pray for things I want to pray for, need to pray for, should pray for. And I also pray in, in the Spirit or pray in my, my spiritual prayer language. My, my family, I was, I'd taken my family on a vacation. We had gone east over to visit relatives. We were on our way back to Texas. We were coming through the Ozarks in the state of Arkansas, in and out of those hills and foggy and those hills, and, and I was, man, I was wanting to get home, and I was pushing it speed-wise. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the speed limit through that area was 55 miles an hour, and I was going somewhat faster than that. I don't care to tell you how much faster. <laughs> but I was clipping along, but I was trying to be careful because there's curvy roads, and we're in the mountains, and, and, uh, <clears throat> and I'm praying. Kids are sleeping. I'm just, I'm just driving and praying. And, and having my daily prayer time. And I'd switch back and forth, pray in English, pray in tongues, pray in English, pray in tongues, like I do. That's my habit. And uh, I was, and then all of a sudden, my prayer language intensified. It was as if my prayer partner, the Holy Spirit, took over and powered it up, took it to another level. I'm praying in tongues pretty uh, energetically. I'm praying in the Spirit. I'm praying in these other words that God gives me. I don't know what I'm praying about. I'm just... I'm just letting the Holy Spirit flow through me, and I'm praying, 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 praying. And all of a sudden, as I'm praying in tongues, I see a mini vision. I saw, and I saw it. It's like everything, it sounds dangerous. I'm on the road. I don't see the road anymore. I see, just quick as a flash, I see a semi tractor trailer rig jackknifed laying in the road on its side with the wheels on the tractor turning, it's, it's been wrecked. I just saw it quick as a flash, and then I, it disappeared, and I see the road again, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, slow down to 35 miles per hour. Man, I hit those brakes, I slowed down to 35 miles per hour. I'm, I'm creeping along at 35 miles per hour. I'm thinking, that was strange. I went, you know, but I knew, I heard him say, 35 miles per hour, 35 miles per hour. So I'm going, I feel dumb, everybody's looking at me, but I'm going 35 miles per hour, you know, in a 55 zone. And I go around one curve, I go around another curve, I think around the third curve, and there it was. There was the same semi I saw, jackknifed, laying on its side, and the wheels on the tractor were still turning. I'm convinced if I hadn't have seen the vision, if I hadn't have heard the Holy Spirit, that it wouldn't have just been the semi laying on its side wrecked. We would have been in that wreck. My little girls would have been, could have been dead. I believe the Holy Spirit saved our lives because I was praying in tongues and had an open channel to God so that he could speak to me supernaturally. Amen, somebody? I tell you, when the Holy Spirit saves your life a time or two, then you'll learn to trust him. I believe, I'm not ashamed, I'm not embarrassed. If you meet me 
uh, in, a, in a fancy restaurant here in town some Friday night and come up to me and say it out loud for the whole restaurant to hear, Brother David, do you speak in tongues? My answer will be, yes, and I'm not ashamed of it. I've had people catch me speaking in tongues in the supermarket line before when I didn't think about where I was. I'm, I, I'm just not ashamed of it. Why? Because I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit helps me. Thank God, He helps me. Any, anything God can do to help me, I want it. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap. I, I want it. So, so supernatural intercession, that's number three. It's, it's a very important thing. All right, now moving right along, I got 11 minutes to get to my real message. Well, of course, I always award myself an extra 15 minutes, so don't pay any attention to that 11 minutes stuff. Okay, so uh, here's number four. I'm talking about the benefit. Do you think that's a pretty good benefit? You know, your lives getting saved, your little girls getting to come home from vacation. I think that's a great benefit. Number four, spiritual language or supernatural prayer language is also an excellent form of thanksgiving. So if you're taking notes, write that down. Excellent thanksgiving. My scripture reference is 1 Corinthians 14, verse, beginning with verse 15. Listen to what Paul says. He says, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit. That means to pray in tongues as we've already proven from the text in the past weeks. I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding or I'll pray in my own language. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding. In other words, I'll worship God in tongues and I'll worship God in my own language, English as far as we're concerned. And then he says something in verse 16, very significant. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit. Now, to, to pray with the Spirit is to pray in tongues. To sing with the Spirit is to sing in tongues. So to bless with the Spirit would be to bless with tongues. The word bless means to speak words of benefit. Positive words. He said, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks? since he does not understand what you say. For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. Now, now he's getting into some of these areas where there's a proper time to pray in tongues and a, and a proper time not to pray in tongues. And he talks about when you've got uh, those who ec occupy the place of the uninformed, the uh, King James, the old King James says, those that occupy the room of the unlearned. The room of the unlearned. I've done some study on the history of the early church, and it seems that in the early church, that often, you know, in the, in the Jewish synagogues, they would separate the men from the women. Uh, men be on one side, women on the other. And that, that was translated over in the earliest churches, women on one side, men on, men on the other. Uh, or in some synagogues, men on the floor and women up in a gallery. And uh, don't, don't get mad at Jesus. That's the way people were doing it, okay? That's just the way people did in some of these cultures. And, uh, and so they would separate the men from the women. It was also practiced by early churches at times to separate or segregate the unlearned or the uninformed. Or we would say people new to the faith, new converts who didn't know much yet about the Scripture. In other words, there were times where they would, it's okay to have a class for a new convert, in other words. It, they would separate people there, and put them in a space or a room for the unlearned so that they could become the learned. They would catch them up. They would begin to teach them the things concerning the Christian faith. But here Paul seems to be saying, listen, uh, don't, he's, he's, he's pointing out the fact that if you decide to say a blessing in the Spirit, to give thanks in the Spirit. Uh, you wouldn't want to do that with the new initiates, the new converts, the people that, because they don't know what's going on, and they can't say, you speak in tongues? He says, you're giving thanks well, but that other person's not edified. They're not helped by that. They don't know what's going on. In other words, there is a time where you don't just pray in tongues. So I've made the case in the last few weeks for speaking in tongues in public because sometimes it is called for. Last Wednesday night, 
I'm not going to do it tonight, but last Wednesday night at the end of the service, I had people come down and we all prayed in tongues for a little bit because they did it several times in the book of Acts where the whole church would come together and they'd pray in tongues right out loud in front of God and everybody, nobody embarrassed, nobody calling them down. Paul then also brought principles to bear about messages in tongues. 9.30 service this past Sunday morning, we had a, a brother come and give a message in tongues with the interpretation, Okay. That's not to be done without an interpretation. And Paul also said, uh, everybody's not going to do that all the time or people will consider you to be mad or touched in saying it. There's proper ways to utilize this in public worship services and proper ways or improper ways. And so he's cautioning us here. He said, you don't, don't go crazy over this. Don't do everything you do in tongues. He says, there's people that don't know what's going on. They're not going to be blessed by that. They're not going to be edified. They're not going to be built up. They can perhaps only confused by that. And so that's the reason that at times here in our church, there's times where we will allow things like that, and other times we'll not. Sometimes, there's been times where people came down and said, I've got a message from the Lord. And I said, well, no, we're not going to do that. Send them back to their seat. Don't be discouraged by that. Don't get hurt by that. Don't get angry at me. Because it's my job to moderate the atmosphere and to make sure that we're hitting the Spirit of God, not missing the Spirit of God. But there, there, should be, there should be order in a service. And if something's out of order, I detect it in my spirit as the lead pastor, then I'm not going to allow it. If someone gives a prophecy or a tongue and interpretation, and I'm nodding my head saying amen, let's hear what the Lord said, that means I've judged it and I believe that's of God. If I judge it, because prophecies and tongues and interpretations should be judged according to the scripture. If you've read this entire chapter, you'll know that. And, and, and uh, so if, if I judge it to be wrong, uh, if it's dangerous, I'll say it right there in front of everybody. If it's just, you know, uh, I, I, the word I'm trying to pick out is neutral. If, if I don't think they really hit the spirit of God, they really heard, but... What they said was nice. It didn't hurt anybody. I'm not going to embarrass them in front of everybody. I'll catch them later and say, eh, let's be more careful. I, I, I don't think we really needed to have, say that and have that. I, I think, you know, because sometimes people being eager to be used by God will do things and say things that really wasn't for us. That was just God talking to them. You know, or sometimes they make it up in their mind because they just want to be used. Everybody still with me? We could, y'all see that we could spend about 50 weeks going through all the details of spiritual manifestations and, and has still have plenty to talk about here. I'm not going to do that at this time, but I'm, I'm just explaining to you how a spirit-filled church should operate according to the scripture. Is that okay? Some people are so tied into these things, they think we're not spiritual enough unless we have, unless we have tongues happening all the time, every service. I, I don't believe that. I, I you don't build ministry on the gifts of the Spirit. You build a ministry on the Word of God. The gifts of the Spirit are to decorate the ministry of the church. They're not, to be, they're, they're not what you build out of, but they decorate and they, and they confirm the Word of God. That's what signs and wonders and spiritual gifts are for. Now, um, here he says that when you're just doing a blessing, something like that, that's not the place really to use tongues. Now, He's not denying you could bless or give thanks in the Spirit because he says, and in fact, look at verse 17, for you indeed give thanks well. The word well means beautiful, fine, or excellent. In fact, in your own home, if you want to give God thanks, if you wanted to pray over your dinner in tongues, then that's a fine, beautiful, excellent way to give thanks. There's nothing wrong with that. But I would say if you have a guest who's not a Christian, save it. <laughs> no need to scare them to death or confuse them. Amen? Just, just pray in English. But notice, there is a time not to do it, but that doesn't change the fact that you're giving thanks well. I said you're giving thanks well. So it is a form of excellent thanksgiving. There's been times at home where I'm praying over my meal and I lift my hands and I... Give God thanks and pray in tongues right over my, it's my house, I can do it if I want to. And I'm doing a good, excellent, beautiful job of doing it. Um, it also explains why, and we don't shut, the Bible says forbid not to speak in tongues. See, there's, there's rules in, the, the, in these scriptures. 
about uh, the times not to do it, and you shouldn't do it out for everybody to hear. But in one place he said if there's no interpreter present, then a person shouldn't speak in tongues in church. He should speak to himself and to God. I, I believe what he means by that. He shouldn't come down here and just rattle off something in tongues that's not going to be interpreted. That's not going to help us. That's just going to be kind of strange. Okay? But there's nothing wrong with you staying in your seat and under your own breath, just between you and God, you giving God thanks in tongues, even in a public worship service. That's why when you come to church at Victory Church, every once in a while, you may hear somebody speaking in tongues in front of you, behind you, two or three seats down from you. Don't be shocked by that. The Bible forbids me to shut them down. There's nothing wrong with them giving thanks in tongues. They're not taking over the service with it. Uh, we're not making a spectacle out of it. But neither are we going to quench the Spirit of God. Amen, somebody? Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. There's, there's ways of doing this. That's the point. In fact, at the end of uh, the chapter 14 there, he says, uh, he says uh, Forbid not to speak in tongues, covet to prophesy, and let all things be done in decency and in order. There's a law of release and a law of restraint there. Let all things be done. Let all things be done. Let speaking in tongues be done. Let prophesying happen. Let healing happen. Let the Holy Spirit flow. Let all things be done. But then there's a law of restraint in decency and in order. So all things should be done, but in a decent fashion, an orderly fashion, and the way God would have it to beautify the service rather than destroy the service. Amen? Amen. Well, so if you pray in tongues at home, you're going to give God thanks well. And if you pray in tongues a little bit here at church, you're, it's a form of excellent thanksgiving. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go to number five. Number five. Rest and refreshing. And uh, I'm going to stop with this one, but I'm going to do this one more, and we'll make this a three-part little series instead of two. Is that okay with everybody? <laughs> I, I don't want to go all the way to 15 after. I, I want to respect your time. And we've gotten into a lot of de- Anybody learn anything tonight? Uh, we've gotten into a lot of details, and, and, uh, and I, I'll, I'll hang around 10, 15 minutes after. If you have other questions... If I had time, I'd do an open Q&A because there's a lot of questions come up with this subject, and I realize that. But I'll hang out, and I'll try. If you have a question, I'll certainly try to answer for you one-on-one after the service. Rest and refreshing. Speaking in tongues is a way for you to receive spiritual rest and refreshing in your heart. Wow. It's kind of like a drink of cold water on a real hot day. Think of, think of it like that. 1 Corinthians 14, 21, Paul says this. He says, in the law, that means Old Testament to us, in the script, Jewish scriptures, it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people. And yet, for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. Now, I believe that that was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost when the 120 believers were filled with the Spirit, they spoke in tongues, the Jews heard them, the crowd gathered, and, uh, three, and, and Peter preached. 3,000 people did hear. And yet, by and large, the nation and the people of Israel and the majority of the Jews rejected the Christian message. How many of you understand that historically, Israelites and Jewish people have rejected the message of Jesus more than they've accepted it? So this, that was a fulfillment. He says, they, they won't hear me. In other words, God said, he prophesied in the Old Testament. We're going to go to that prophecy here in just a moment. He prophesied that there was coming a day where he would put his spirit on Gentiles and they would come to the Jews, <clears throat> to, to the Jews and right in front of them speak in other languages as a supernatural sign to them that God was speaking to them. And yet... After all that, they would still reject the message of Christ. And on the day of Pentecost, these Jews gathered up and they said, we are here, these people are speaking in other languages. And we recognize, we recognize these languages from the Gentile world. And they said, and we hear them speaking the wonderful works of God. That's in Acts the second chapter, the wonderful works of God. And so God fulfilled that sign. 
God predicted there would be speaking in tongues, that people would speak in languages they had never learned, supernaturally by the Spirit, and it was to be a sign to unbelieving Israel. Paul, of course, makes the case again here in 1 Corinthians 14 that tongues are for a sign to them who do not believe. And I've made the case, how can it be a sign to unbelievers if they never heard them? They, there's no way. So, so it is scriptural for unbelievers to hear some speaking in tongues. Do not be afraid. Now, I know how, I know, I know how you are. Sometimes you don't want to invite somebody to your church because you're afraid that very Sunday is when somebody's going to speak in tongues. Don't act all innocent like you don't know what I'm talking about. And perhaps you haven't stopped to consider that what your friend needs is to hear speaking in tongues. Your friend, your relative, your mother-in-law maybe needs to be rattled by the Spirit of God. It might do her some good. I mean, you know, we accept it, well, we'll tolerate it, but it's kind of weird, Pastor David. But, you know, that doesn't change the fact that the presence of God is contained in that operation and the presence of God can arrest their attention. And I, I've seen more people leave church after spiritual manifestations and specifically speaking in tongues. I've seen more people's responses like, whew, man, I felt God when that happened then that was just weird, I'm done, I'm mad, I'm out, I'm not coming back. I've heard that a time or two. But what is that? That's the difference in faith and unbelief. Simply put. You know, it's real, it's of God, and God is smarter than we are. So maybe we ought to stop protecting ourselves and our reputation and say, God, we just want you to be God, and if that's the way you want to do it, then you know best, we're going to let you do it. Can I have a better amen? amen? Come on, we need to have some trust in God. You say, well, I, don't, I just don't believe in speaking in tongues. Well, you just don't have much faith, do you? Because the Bible says it. I, I'm not going to get you anywhere by, by, by babying you. Well, you know, we're not going to let that happen in our church right out here in the auditorium because we wouldn't want to make anybody uncomfortable. Oh, shut up. People like that make me sick. That's stupid. That's dumb. I, yeah, I use the S word. That is unspiritual. It is rebellious. And it's the spirit of antichrist. The spirit of antichrist. The word antichrist doesn't mean against Christ. It means the replacement of Christ. And any spirit that tempts us to replace the Holy Spirit with a spirit of unbelief is the spirit that replaces Christ. What are you saying, Pastor David? Unless I believe in speaking in tongues, I'm not very spiritual. That's exactly what I'm saying. Don't make any mistake about this. I'm saying either you're unlearned, and thank God you're in the room of the learned tonight, and we're learning. Amen? Amen. Or you're rejecting God's revelation knowledge, and that's not a very good place for you to be in. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to be straightforward. I'm trying to be honest. I'm trying to be transparent. Everybody says, we want the pastors to be transparent. Okay, you get it. <laughs> Transparency. I grew up around Christians that were scared to death of anything about the Holy Spirit, and I'm telling you, it never, I should say, well, that, that belief never produced any godliness in their lives. It didn't produce anything but a bunch of religious, religious hypocrites. They're deacon on Sunday and they're flirting with women on Monday. I'm not saying no tongue talker never sinned because we know they have, amen? But I'm, I am saying, what I am saying is, we need the Spirit of God. We need everything God's got for us. We, we, let, folks, we're a mess. We need some help up in here. And that's exactly why the Holy Spirit came. Let's not shut him down. Let's let him do something. I'm ready for this church to go to 2,000 people on a weekend. 
And we're not going to get there playing around. We're, gonna, we're not going to get there on our own. We need the Lord to help us. Amen, somebody? We need the Lord. I need to finish this sermon. We've got to hurry up. <laughs> okay, so uh, where was I? Where was I? Where was I? Oh, rest and refresh. Okay, now go to Isaiah. Real quick, go to Isaiah. I knew I'd take that extra 15 minutes anyway. Isaiah 28, verse 11. Isaiah 28, verse 11. Here's where he, he's quoting from. Here's what it says. For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people. To, then he says this. this is, Paul didn't quote this part, but it's right there. To whom he said this, this what? These stammering lips and these other tongues. This is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing Yet they would not hear. What he says is that when God sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and those Christian believers started speaking in tongues within earshot of the Jews, that God was giving a sign and a wonder to the Jewish people and he was communicating to the Jewish people that the Spirit of God was available to people on the earth and that the Spirit of God would give them rest and they certainly were in a condition of unrest under the Roman rule. And he said, the Spirit of God is going to give you a refreshing and they were dried up with their religion and their Phariseeism and their Sadduceeism and all of their goofed up denominations in their day just like we've got in our day. Hello? And God was saying, I'm telling you, I have a rest for you and a refreshing for you. And yet, I know it as sure as I'm alive, God said, they're not going to listen. And they didn't. But it comes to us, will we be different from the Jews? Will we listen? Will we hear that sign and wonder? Will we let God speak to us? Will we take up on the promise of a rest, a spiritual rest? A spiritual refreshing. If we'll be filled with the Spirit. Jesus said, he that believeth on me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. He's going to receive the Holy Spirit and we can drink. He said, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. Why? Because that drink we're drinking is the rest and the refreshing. Can I tell you something, Christian believer? You don't need alcohol. You don't need beer. You don't need whiskey. You don't, come on, somebody, I'm preaching. You don't need wine. What you, the Bible says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit of the living God. That's the refreshing you're looking for. <laughs> somebody shout amen, stand up so I can quit. Y'all got to stand up so I can stop. Holy Spirit of God, we worship you. We honor your God. We acknowledge you. We recognize you. We need your rest and refreshing in our lives. Yes, yes. We need your life. We need your sustenance. We need your power. We need your revelation. We need your intercession. We need your miracles. We need your visions. You said that we're going to see visions and dream dreams and prophesy because of the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Father, we know that we cannot live this life in the flesh. We've got to live it in the Spirit by the power of the Spirit of God within us. Father, we ask you by your Holy Spirit, by your Holy Spirit, flow through us, work through us, Achieve through us, speak through us, minister through us. For the world does not need our touch. It needs the touch of the Spirit of the living God. Yes, Lord. Yes. We thank you. We praise you. We magnify you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, I said I wasn't going to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Throw your hands up and begin to pray in the Spirit. If you pray in the Spirit, come on, pray in the Spirit. Don't, don't be turned off by this. This is a New Testament Book of Acts experience. Vibra katara vosandai. Libra katara vosanda ravishimai. Lihen daravosa. Nimbran daravosa taravikamai. Oh, we worship you, Lord. We give you thanks tonight. We just release the Spirit of God. You said... Let all things be done. We release the prayer language, Lord God. We want your Holy Spirit to pray through us. Yes, God. 
Yes. Yes, says the Lord, listen to me and I will speak to you. Watch for me and I will appear to you. I'll show you visions. I'll give you dreams. Yes, says the Lord. I'll give you rest and refreshing and strength and power and flow through you to accomplish the will of God in your lives. I'll pray for you. I'll speak to you. I will lead you and guide you, says the Lord. Learn to be sensitive to my spirit. Allow my spirit to flow through your life freely, says the Lord. This is the wind that you've looked for. This is that power of God that can carry you. I've said that I will empower you. Let me do it, says the Lord. Let my spirit flow through your life like mighty rivers of living water, says the Spirit of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Come on, let's rejoice. That's a prophetic word, a prophecy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Everybody say, speaking in tongues is the doorway into the supernatural. Oh, it is. It is. In the book of Acts, they... It was only after they spoke in tongues that they had healings and deliverances and raising the dead and prophecies and all those things happening and other people getting filled. They had to, it had to start somewhere. It starts when God begins to flow through us. Don't be afraid of that. You say, well, that's different. Right? That's, yeah, it is different from you. It's the Spirit of God. God wants to make us different. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Come on up, Taylor. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you tonight. We're believing, God, Lord God, for revival. Lord God, for an outpouring of the Spirit of God in this place. Lord, we're believing you for souls to be saved, for bodies to be healed, and Lord God, those in bondage to be delivered from the power of the enemy. Not by our might or power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. We believe it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen to that. Come amen. on, let's give thank the Lord a big hand clap. Come on, we worship you, Lord.